My mom um, is kind of Russian heritage, and over there you try to get as much fat as you can get because it's cold winters. So uh, she had a, just a barrage of fatty foods on the table from like deep fried oysters to rack of lamb to like mushrooms and butter sauce. And so I'm for sure um, packing around a couple extra Toblerones on my waist today. <laughs> I think the only exercise I did all break was throw a fishing rod into the water once. So, uh, I don't know if you're into the whole New Year's resolution thing. I myself am not, uh, you know, super big on the New Year's resolutions, but I would say that I have uh, a few loosely defined uh, New Year's resolutions this year and loosely held. One would be to lose the Toblerones off the waist. Uh, I want to chisel the body back to when I was 22 years old. Uh, another is I want to learn how to play guitar. Always wanted to, to do that well, always wanted to be a bit of a rock star. And the last one is uh, I want to get back on track with my walk with Jesus because I felt like over the last year that's kind of petered a little bit. And these aren't really new resolutions for me. You know, I've had them before. I've made them before uh, with varying degrees of success on follow through. And usually my strategy for attaining my New Year's goals is the same one year to the next. It's always the same. And the strategy is this. Work harder. Put in more effort. Isn't that usually our, our strategy for change every year? If we can just work harder, you know, if we can put in more effort, if we can row those oars a little bit faster, then we will do the things that we want to do and we will be the people that we want to be. But more effort you know, isn't usually the total strategy for change. You know, there's some truth to that. Now, if we're not putting in hard work, if we're not disciplined, we're probably not going to accomplish anything that's worth anything. We need some focus and some discipline. But at some point, we need to be honest with ourselves that more effort alone isn't doing the job. It's not producing all the change that we want it to. We have a limited storehouse of effort. Now, the amount that we have this year the amount of effort in our storehouse is probably going to be the same as the amount that we had last year. And just deciding that we're going to produce some more probably isn't going to make it happen. That's kind of like treating our humanity like a, like a dog sled team. You know, that we think we'll go faster and, and run harder if we just whip it more. You know, mush, hit it harder, and those dogs are going to work better for us. At some point, we need to recognize that the dogs, if they're going to go faster and farther and do better, are going to need more than just a whipping and a command to do so. And the Bible has a much more nuanced strategy for change. Listen to Ecclesiastes 10.10. It says this, Using a dull axe requires great strength. So sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. So we can attempt to swing the axe harder and harder, which usually leads to hurting ourselves in some way. Or we can sharpen the blade. Use our humanity as it's meant to be used. And we'll probably get a lot better results in the end. Now, usually, uh, or, sorry, every, every once in a while, I like to do a, a different sort of sermon. Or rather than just expounding a text, I like to tell the story of a great follower of Jesus. Someone who has put the word into action, who has incarnated the word of Jesus in their life. And let that inspire us to live differently. Help put our lives in a different perspective. And so that's what I want to do today. I want to tell you the story of George Mueller. It's this guy here, German dude that kind of has a beard like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, in the gold department, George Mueller accomplished an incredible amount of stuff for Jesus in his lifetime. 
He started orphanages in England in the 1800s out of a love for Jesus. And uh, these orphanages grew so large that over his lifetime, there were 10,000 orphans that went through them. He also started 117 schools, which educated over 120,000 kids. And this was at a time in England when education wasn't free, the government wasn't educating everybody. So he raised enough money and started a foundation to educate 120,000 kids. He educated so many kids in England that he was accused of stealing jobs from you know, professional people. He was raising the station of the poor above what was natural for them. He was helping too many poor people get educated. That was the accusation. And his ministries for kids received 1.4 million English pounds. And that was an incredible amount of money at his day when the average salary for the year was 50 pounds. So about uh, the equivalent of a 90 million pounds or 180 million dollars went through his hands and into kids' lives all over England. And after all of that, starting at the age of 70, he went on a 17-year missionary journey around the world when the world was a much more wild place than it is now. He went to Russia and India and China and into the Middle East, preaching the gospel. Mueller did all of that. He has an incredibly huge legacy. But much more importantly, it all flowed from a spirit that was kept sharp for Jesus. Mueller had a, had a, a strong, strong commitment to investing daily in his relationship with Jesus. And everything that he did flowed out of and was shaped by that relationship with Christ. He fell in love with Jesus as a young man and from then on every day was life with Jesus. Listening to what Jesus had to say in his word and then putting that into action in his life. So Mueller's life and legacy weren't so much a, a, a heroic straining at the oars or the whipping of the dogs all day long to get him to do more for Jesus. His story is about a man kept sharp by taking Jesus at his word. And so that's why I want to tell you his story today. To inspire you, hopefully, so that next year, so that this year will be shaped more by a relationship with Christ than the last one. A uh, little disclaimer, uh, when I thought about telling you someone's story, a great follower of Jesus, I wanted that person not to be a pastor or a missionary because there's lots of those stories out there, but there's lots of other great followers of Jesus who aren't pastors and missionaries, and it's a bit self-aggrandizing for a pastor to be telling you about another heroic pastor. So I thought Mueller wasn't a pastor and a missionary because I didn't know much about him. I just know he started these orphanages, but when I started to read about him, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's a pastor and a missionary, so you'll just have to put up with that. Uh, Mueller was born in Germany in 1805. His family was fairly well off. His dad worked for the government, which as we all know is always a cushy job. And so uh, while George was young, he was a spoiled kid. And his dad actually had designs for him to be a pastor when he grew up. But this wasn't because his family was particularly spiritual. Uh, in Germany at the time, everybody called themselves a Christian. Everybody went to church. But that didn't mean that you had a real, live, active relationship with Christ or that you prayed to God when you were at home. George's dad wanted him to become a pastor because that was a bit of a rock star profession back in Germany at the time. It paid actually quite well. It paid better than most other jobs. So his dad was hoping that he would make a good wage. And actually, uh, when he retired, his dad was hoping to move into the parsonage that George would have as a pastor. So George was put into Bible schools even as a young boy. And he probably wouldn't have been uh, your first pick for a pastor, judging by his character. He was, as I said, a spoiled, rich kid. And even worse, he was a thief and a liar. His dad uh, actually gave him a generous allowance. Uh, he had a lot of money that he would spend on his habits. But uh, it wasn't enough for him. He was always sneaking and stealing money. And that, that started in the home. 
And his dad started to suspect that George was taking money from him. Uh, so one day he decided to try and catch him red-handed. He was in his study. He pulled out, his dad pulled out a bunch of coins and money. He put them on the desk. And then he called George in. He's left that money there. He said he had to leave for a second, walked out, came back. There was less money on the desk. He said, George, you're stealing money from me. And George denied. He says, no, I'm not. So his dad searched him from head to toe and found money, the money that was stolen in his shoe. So we got a harsh, harsh beating from his dad from that. But that wasn't enough to change him. He just decided that from then on he was going to be much more careful and much more sneaky about taking money. So the, the thieving and the lying continued throughout his adolescence. Whenever money was left around, George would take it, whether that was at home or that was money for his school fees, or money that was supposed to go to church, he would take it and then lie about it. And by the time he was 14, he was spending very little time at school. He was taking all this money, he was going out drinking and gambling with his friends out to the wee hours of the morning. Once he was jailed for a week uh, for trying to short uh, an innkeeper for a week's stay, Another time he was in big trouble for racking up huge gambling debts, so he pretended uh, that he had lost or that his school fees had been taken from him, told that to all his buddies, and they gathered together some extra money to pay off uh, his supposedly lost school fees. And several times George's conscience got a hold of him and he would try to change. He knew he was living bad, and this wasn't right. This wasn't living according to what he'd been taught. And so he would try to change. But within days, he'd be back to his old habits of gambling and drinking and blowing all the cash that he could steal. And he was doing all of this while he was going to the finest divinity schools, the finest pastoral training schools in the country. And nothing changed for George until he was 20 years old. And he was out for a walk with his buddy who was named Beta. I'm walking along and chatting and Beta said that he had uh, started to go to kind of a small group Bible study on Saturday nights. And George said, well, what goes on at these Bible studies? What do you do there? He said, oh, we sing some songs, we read some scriptures, and we pray. And George said, well, I want to come. I want to check this out. So Beta was kind of wondering if he was serious about it, but he was, so they went. And on Saturday night, they went to this Bible study. And George was instantly kind of um, impressed with how he was welcomed in the home of this person that was hosting the Bible study. And then he was surprised uh, at how they prayed. They started singing a song. And then they knelt down for prayer. And that, that blew George's mind. He'd never seen anybody kneel and pray before. That was strange. And then when he heard the words that were coming out of the mouth of the host who was praying, his world was also rocked because you could see that this guy actually knew God and he was praying out of a real relationship with God. He'd been in Christian schools and Bible schools and gone to church for his whole life. And he'd had a high education at a pastoral level, but he knew that he could not pray like this man could, as if God was real, as if God was listening, as if God actually wanted to change your life and respond to your prayers. And that night, and the week after he was changed, he met Jesus and he wrote this about that week. It had pleased God to teach me something of the meaning of that precious truth. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I understood why the Lord Jesus died on the cross and bore the punishment due to us, so we wouldn't have to bear it ourselves. And therefore, apprehending in some measure the love of Jesus for my soul, I was constrained to love him in return. What all the exhortations of my father and others could not affect what all my own resolutions could not bring about, even to renounce a life of sin and debauchery, I was enabled to do, constrained by the love of Jesus. So that day was the beginning of a new life that, that radically changed George. He stopped his drinking. He stopped his gambling. He resolved to stop lying. He struggled with that. He'd mess up. He'd repent, ask for Jesus' forgiveness, and try to get back on track. 
He sent a letter to his father saying that he'd encountered Christ. And his father wrote back angry about it, wondering if this was going to jeopardize George's planned future. Tensions rose even higher with his father when he said that he wanted to be a missionary. And he came home and his dad was angry and said, George, how, how are you going to you know, have a parsonage for me that I can move in for if, if you become a missionary? That's not going to work out. His dad said that, you know, I'm not going to call you my son anymore if you plan to become a missionary. And then his dad started weeping and begging him not to waste his life being a missionary. But George was firm. And then he was put through a great test of faith. His father had been supporting his education. He had two years more left. And it was quite expensive for him to go to school. But he decided that he couldn't take money from his father anymore. Because he wasn't going to fulfill his father's dream for him. So he decided to, to stop. And just started praying that God would provide money for him to go to school. And God did provide. He was able to get some work translating some documents from English to German. And he was uh, given housing in an orphanage that was next to the university. They always kept some rooms open for poor students. So he was able to live there. You know, we might sometimes wonder about people when they say, you know, hard times in your life are usually places where God works and he's building something for your future. He's, he's investing in you, equipping you for something he's going to do in your life later. But that was absolutely true for George. First of all, he was learning to trust that God would provide no matter what, when there was no idea where he would get the money he needed to do ministry from. And secondly, he was watching and learning how orphanages ran. Well, fast forward a few years, Mueller finished school. He planned to become a missionary to Jewish people and he moved to London to get some training for that end. But there was a few twists and turns and he ended up in rural England pastoring a little church there. Met a, met a woman there that he fell in love with. Her name was Mary Groves. She loved Jesus as much as he did and they got married and they had a happy union that lasted their whole lives long serving Jesus together. And shortly after they were married, uh, they gave up their salary at their church. And actually, uh, Sean told me last week he wants to do this too. Um, so yeah, we, you can just add that on to mine. Um, back then, offerings uh, were taken differently. Uh, you actually paid according to the quality of the seat you had. So like people up here would be paying 100 and 90 and 80 and so forth. Or maybe it'd be the other way around for you. I don't know. You want to pay for the seats at the back. And George knew that this was clearly ridiculous. You shouldn't have to pay, you know, for your seat, or how good it was in church. So he cut that off and he told the church that he was just going to live based on voluntary donations that they would give. And they didn't even have an offering time in church like we did. And from that moment on, he resolved that he would depend solely on God for his family's needs. And he would never tell anyone that he needed money. He would just pray. That's how he planned for the rest of his life. He was just going to pray and expect that God would provide when telling nobody what he needed. Uh, him, his, him and his wife also read these words from Jesus from the Gospels. It said, sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Whatever, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So they made a resolution that they were going to obey this command. They had no salary at the time, but they sold everything that they had in their house that they didn't need, and they gave it to the poor. They were in their mid-twenties at this point. And from then on, for the rest of their lives, no matter what they did, God provided for them again and again and again and again. And they never went hungry and they never lacked anything that they needed. Within a couple weeks of forsaking his salary, all the family money ran out. And there was just a few coins left and George stopped sleeping at night. So he prayed and asked God for help. Later that afternoon, a few hours later, they were visiting a lady who said that the Lord had been prompting her all the last night to give them some money that they were in need. And so she asked him, are you in need, George? 
but he'd resolve and said, I wouldn't ever tell anybody that I was actually in need. So he just kind of blew it off. But she said, no, George, the Lord's put it on my heart. I have to give you some money. And this kind of thing happened all the time. George and his wife would, would have almost nothing less than, and God would impress upon someone's heart that they needed money and they would give them cash. People brought them meat and bread and money came in the mail. Unexpected wages came their way. And they always had food on the table and money to pay every bill. Eventually, two kids were born to them, a boy and a girl. Their church grew in this rural place. And uh, at one point, George Feldy uh, got a calling to co-pastor a church in a nearby city of Bristol. So he moved there with a friend of his and they started co-pastoring a couple of churches. Now in 1840, Bristol was going through some serious growing pains. Uh, there was big industrialization of agriculture and so a lot of small time farmers were being displaced and they were making their way into the city. And they were poor, they had no work, they were looking for jobs. Also the economy in Bristol was on a downturn, it was a shipping industry and they were losing their place in the national economy. And to make matters worse, there was a, a huge cholera epidemic that was ripping through the town and killing people. It was not known at the time that cholera uh, was passed through dirty water. And poor sewage systems. And Bristol had a terrible sewage system. So people were being infected and dying in quite large numbers. And that meant that there were a lot of children who were left without parents. And had to live on the streets. The Mueller's were still living day to day depending on God to provide for them. Uh, they took no official salary from this new church that they went to. There were about 60 people that attended there. They were all poor, so you can imagine how much offering was given for the Mueller's. But even though they had very little, they decided they were going to start providing for some of these kids out on the streets. And so Mrs. Mueller would feed kids that would come to their back door in the evening. And the word got out. Now there's, few, there's, there's food at the Mueller's. So more people came and more kids came. And it got to the point where at night there was, at every night there was 50 kids coming to the back door, coming to the back kitchen to be fed by Mrs. Mueller. And this, you know, all, all, the whole time that they're providing for these kids, even though they have nothing, more and more and more money starts to come to them so that they can take care of these kids that are coming to their door. But the neighbors started to get ticked off. There was 50 kids coming to the back door uh, every night. That was causing some problems, so they had to put on hold uh, feeding the kids for a while. But before long, the desire to care for hungry orphans kind of started to rise more and more in George's heart. He thought about it. God had consistently provided for his family all the time, even though they never asked for anything. God also provided funds so they could care for poor people, even though they didn't ask. God provided funds so he could start an institution uh, that su supported funds for missionaries and for uh, schools. And Mueller thought, you know, God has provided for all this stuff and I've never even asked. So can't God provide even more to help more people, especially these orphans that are all over the streets? And he started praying every day. God, is this something you want me to do? You want me to start an orphanage? And he questioned his motives and he saw it inside. You know, do I want to do this for the right reasons? Is this about me or is this about God? And after a few weeks, it was clear in his mind that he should. Yes, this is something that God wanted him to do is step out of faith and start an orphan home. And the reason for, for starting this home, he felt, wasn't just that he saw such a great need amongst orphans at the time, but he saw a great spiritual need in the hearts of the people of Bristol. And he would preach these words from Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things, all the things that you need will be added to you. But the way that he saw Christians living was not at all that way. He saw people worried about money, working way too many hours, to provide for their families, taking work that wasn't at all glorifying to God, or entering into shady business practices to provide for their families. And he figured people needed to see proof that God does live up to his promises, that he does answer prayer, that he will provide for you if you live the way he calls you to. So he figured if he could start an orphanage that ran solely based on prayer, 
that never let anybody know about needs just like he'd lived. If he could start an orphanage that would run like that, that it would prove to people that God is still faithful and God still answers prayer. And as he was reading the Bible himself, uh, his, his heart was caught up with a verse from the Psalms that says, Open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. And he felt that God was telling him that he should not start this orphanage until he had everything that he needed to begin it. And that would be a building, some full-time workers, because he was already a pastor, and a thousand pounds, which at the time would be almost a half a million dollars today. So he put the word out in the newspapers that he was starting an orphanage. And don donations started to pour in. Things like mugs and plates and spoons and pillowcases and tablecloths. And a year's salary from somebody that he totally didn't expect. And within two days, he had three people that gave not only everything that they owned to the work, but themselves to work with it. A poor seamstress gave him the equivalent of two years' salary, 100 pounds. And he tried to argue with her, this is too much, you can't afford this. But she said this, the Lord Jesus has given his last drop of blood for me. And should I not give him this 100 pounds? And within a month, he had everything that he needed to open this first orphan home, except for the orphans. And they weren't showing up, and he realized he had to pray for that too. So he prayed, and the next day, some applications started to come in. And with four, within four months, his first orphan home opened for 17 girls. And that one had barely opened and started before plans for a second home were laid. And within a year, another home was opened up for younger boys and girls. And a third home soon followed. And the money and the provisions just kept coming in and coming in and coming in. Now, even though God was working, not everything was perfect for the Mueller's during these years. Their son, their young son, became ill and died. And George himself got quite ill and was close to death. He had to take a break from ministry and go off and uh, spend some time getting better. And many times during those first five years, the orphan homes were on the brink of having to shut down or entering into poverty. In 1838, he wrote this, In a day or two again, many pounds, many dollars will be needed. My eyes are up to the Lord. But before evening, a donation of five pounds came in. It was just enough for them to scrape by. The woman that brought it said that she was praying when the thought came to her that, you know, maybe the orphans in the orphanage need some money, and she brought it by. Two days later, they're out of money again. No idea what they're going to have for supper. And Mueller prayed. And before the day was out, a lady whom George had never met brought by 12 pounds. And they were on and off like that for five years, often brought to the brink of poverty. But God always provided. There would be a random person out in the street that would be walking by who just stick some dollar bills in his hand. Or somebody would donate some bedding. Or something that they could sell for a little bit of money to feed the orphans. And the workers themselves would give everything that they had. And the kids even pitched in. They would uh, sew. They knew how to knit and to sew. And so they would sell socks and hats and things like that. And for years, funds from an, an anonymous donor would be recorded uh, in a book of records that George kept. And the only record was this from a servant of the Lord Jesus and after he died, it was, it was discovered that this was Mueller himself. Over his lifetime, he donated 82,000 pounds of money that was given to him personally. He gave it all to the orphanage. So despite all the hard times of those four years, no child ever went without a meal or, or went without shoes or went without medical care or from love from their caretakers. God always came through in response to prayer. And this vision to reach more kids kept growing. More money kept coming in and things snowballed upward. Eventually, enough money came in from all over the world so that George could buy some land and build a large orphan home. 
and built another one and another one and another one until the capacity went from 17 girls at the start to 2,000 orphans being cared for every day. And by that time, Mueller was 70 years old and, and decided to fulfill this dream he had of being a missionary. So he went all over the world for the next 17 years until he was 87 years old preaching the gospel in every corner of the world. And he died when he was 92 years old. Probably on his knees praying. Lady came in with some tea in the morning and found him beside his bed. And he'd always said this, the chief business of every day is first of all to seek to be truly at rest and happy in God. So maybe none of us are going to have the kind of legacy the hugeness or the greatness of the legacy of Mueller. And we're not Mueller. We have different gifts. We live at a different time. And God has different plans for us. But I think we can learn from him and be inspired by Mueller's story this year. Especially how to stop pretending with God, I think. Stop pretending that our lives are shaped by him when maybe they're not. When I look at mine, I know that there's large portions that are not at all shaped by God and His will. So maybe we should do an assessment this year of our lives. What are the forces that have shaped your life over the last couple of years? You know, have you been worried about money? Has that been driving your life? Are you worried about comfort? Are you trying to build kind of a fortress around you and your family? Are you living for recognition and success? I know that I want to return to Jesus and let Him shape my life. And I think that that begins with daily investing in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Opening His Word. Seeing what He has to say. Letting that drive my thoughts and my plans. Letting it kind of inspire me to take steps of faith. What's God's will? Today, what's God's will for my life this month? How could I step out in faith and actually do it? And I think it's all driven just by daily seeking Jesus in prayer and in His Word. So if you want to see your walk with Jesus change this year, then I would say sharpen your axe instead of trying to drive the dog team. Let your relationship with Jesus sharpen your spirit and drive your life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you get a hold of us and that your grace not only goes so far as to, to forgive us for mistakes and to forgive us for how we've been living, but drive us to new life, new life for you. Lord, we want that this year. We don't want to just repeat the past. We want to grow, especially in a love for you that would saturate not just a time spent with you, but every area of our lives. So we ask that you would, you would light that fire of a love for you in our hearts and let that change our lives over this next year. We pray this for your glory, not ours. Amen.